Uh, my name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this event uh, with um, Andrea Ritchie, who's just released a new book, uh, Practicing New Worlds, Abolition, and Emergent Strategies. Uh, she's generously agreed to join us tonight in conversation with author Shane Burley uh, to discuss emergent strategy in the context of the struggle against white supremacy and the far right. So Firestorm is a 15-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events uh, that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to do some events like this one online, both because we love to be able to connect with folks at a distance, and also because we know for many folks in our community, COVID remains a significant barrier to face-to-face -face events. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be hosting additional virtual events, including conversations with uh, Marissa Holmes, author of Organizing Occupy Wall Street, uh, and Eric Larson, um, who has a new book out uh, from AK Press, Polymath, uh, The Life and Professions of Dr. Alex Comfort, author of The Joy of Sex. So if you're interested in learning more about future events, follow us on social media, and I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. So we're going to get started. Uh, some brief introductions. Uh, Andrea J. Ritchie is a Black, lesbian, immigrant survivor who's been documenting, organizing, advocating, litigating, and agitating around policing and criminalization of Black women, girls, trans, and gender nonconforming people for the last four decades. She's a co-founder of Interrupting Criminalization and the In Our Names Network. And in those capacities and through the Community Resource Hub, she works with dozens of groups across the country, organizing to divest from policing and invest in strategies that will create safer communities. Uh, Andrea is co-author with Miriam Kaba of No More Police, got a copy of here, uh, Case for Abolition. And she's uh, a nationally recognized researcher, policy analyst, and expert on policing and criminalization, uh, currently living in Detroit, Michigan. Thanks so much for being here. And Shane, who we have had the pleasure of hosting for a few events in the past as well, um, uh, is an author based in Portland, Oregon. Um, he's written Why We Fight, uh, essays on fascism, resistance, and surviving the apocalypse, as well as Fascism Today. Oh, there was a ugly fight. <laughs> uh, fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It, um, and also edited the collection uh, No Pasaron, Anti-Fascist Dispatches uh, from World in Crisis, which I know we're gonna be talking about a little bit tonight. Uh, yeah, and Shane's work has also appeared in several other anthologies and journals. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for making time to be with us tonight. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks so much, Liberty. Me too. Um, so this is Andrea speaking for folks who uh, can't see me for whatever reason. I am a very light-skinned Black woman with uh, blue glasses on and uh, no more police t uh, long sleeve t-shirt. Maybe it's like bad form to wear one book shirt while talking about the other, but they're all of a piece. For me, I'm sitting in my uh, messy house and my abolitionist cat is surveilling me at the moment. Um, and I, I just really wanted to deeply thank Firestorm for hosting um, tonight's event. And I'm wondering if I am frozen because, oh no, Shane, okay. Um, and, I live in Wawiatinong, otherwise known as Detroit, on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, Wyandot, Potawatomi, and Odawa people. And, um, you know, our infrastructure can lead for some shaky internet. So hopefully someone will text me or flag me if I'm breaking up. Um, I'm really so been looking forward to this conversation in particular about practicing new worlds. Um, because as folks will see, if you read it, the there's a lot of um, conversation I have with myself back and forth uh, about emergent strategies as pathways to abolition and uh, 
that means moving at a level that is focused on critical connections, building communities of practice, um, creating networks that can shape larger complex systems. It's um, a collection of ideas that draw from indigenous um, life ways, that draw from uh, complexity science, it uh, draws from um, many sort of abolitionist organizing experiments and practices and teaches us that we, you know, replicate um, large systems through our, at the smallest level, that we need to move in ways that are nonlinear, iterative, adaptive, experimental, learning from experiments and practicing towards abolition in ways that create new possibilities for worlds that we have not yet lived that are rooted in transformative justice and interdependence. And, and that's just sort of the, the top of it. I think it's particularly um, the, the struggle that I was having while I was writing it and I was saying to Shane and Liberty earlier, uh, no pasaran sat on my desk the whole time that I was writing it. And part of the reason, and I feel like I was been in conversation with Shane um, in my head for, for over a year. And so I'm grateful tonight to be in conversation uh, live. But the thing I was struggling with is whether the strategies that have come to be called emergent strategies, what what we do, and many people I spoke with about the book also um, had this question about how they hold up when the state sees what we're practicing and what we're building and what we're creating beyond existing structures of policing and punishment as a threat and comes down on them with the full force of the state. And I think um, one question, you know, place that came up was around the struggle to stop Cop City. And I think in this moment, particularly, I've been trying uh, in each of the events that we've been posting around the book is to think about this moment where there's literally genocidal violence raining down on the people of Gaza and has been for the last 20 days and continues to intensify every single day. And how do these ideas of, you know, emergent strategy hold up in the face of such a just brutal display of state power, of course, funded uh, by the U.S. government and, and therefore by all of us and, and legitimized by many forces in the U.S., including the right. And I also wondered, you know, how they held up against the assaults um, that white supremacy are escalating, or white the, the right and white supremacists are escalating inside the U.S. and how to be mindful of, of the, the kinds of attacks that we're living under right now, whether it's attacks on Muslim and Palestinian people, whether it's attacks on trans and gender non-conforming people's existence, whether it's people walking into supermarkets and shooting black people, that we really can't be unserious in this moment about the strategies that we're deploying and whether they're building the power and protection necessary for our communities to survive these kinds of assaults um, that we're living under. And so those were the conversations I was having with myself while, and many other abolitionist organizers while writing about whether these strategies were sufficient to meet this, this kind of moment that we're living in right now and the kind of violence that Shane has been documenting and writing about and, and thinking about for some time. So that's one of the reasons it feels important um, to be in this conversation. I do urge uh, folks, and I've been asking folks to do this, inviting folks to do this in every conversation that I've had around this book is to use the time that we're together talking about this to also take action. So um, I'm sure many of you have called your representatives today or attended a protest today or made some intervention in conversation or with other people around um, joining in Palestinians and resisting the the genocidal violence uh, in Gaza. And um, thankfully, um, Shane is offering a, um, a link that uh, hopefully Liberty will be able to put in the chat uh, for folks from Jewish Voice for Peace. And then also I'm gonna um, put one in the chat uh, or put one here for uh, Liberty to put. Um, in the chat to everyone that is from the US co uh, campaign for um, coalition policy and coalition rights. I'm trying to organize the words in my head, but it's a US campaign for um, Palestinian rights. Um, and 
So I think that thinking about how we make an intervention or, or using this time together to, to make an intervention to speak out and resist this violence is important, but also it's important for us to take some time to think about how that violence has been fueled over years through many kinds of right-wing organizing, both in Israel and in the US and in connection with each other, and then how we interrupt that. So, and I think the, the thing that early on when I was um, sort of thinking about abolition and emergent strategies, I think one of the very early drafts wrote something like, of course, emergent strategies inevitably lead to abolition. And one of my early readers looked at it and was like, yeah, that seems like a bit of a leap, Andrea. You need to break that down a bit. And Ill Weaver, uh, one of the founders of Complex Movements Collective, which is definitely one of the people architects of thinking about emergent strategies in the way that uh, we are now, but also practicing them as part of abolitionist organizing, pointed me to a study that was done by the Rand Institute that talked about actually many things that could be characterized as emergent strategies being used by many different people. So they were looking at how the Zapatistas were using it, but they were also using, looking at how white supremacists were using it. They were looking at how a multiplicity of political actors were using what could later be called emergent strategies. So while it's true that some aspects or principles of emergent strategies like um, interdependence or being focused on transformative justice um, point us towards abolition. I was um, saddened to think about the ways in which these strategies are also being deployed by the right. And I think that's where, if you haven't read No Pasadan, you must. If you haven't read everything that Shane has written, you must. Because I was, I in it learned so much about how the white supremacist, Christian, alt-right, and all the sort of neo-Nazis and all the conglomerations of right in the US are increasingly using very similar strategies to build power. Um, and of course, not just in the US, but transnationally. So I guess that's kind of where I wanna start the conversation is to ask you, Shane, where you see the right deploying strategies that are focused on critical connections, on relationships, on replicating things at the small level to a systems level, to working in ways that are deeply decentralized, but also kind of practicing their vision of the world that they want to see in everyday interactions in ways that are sh actually shifting the systems and conditions under which we're living. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Thanks for everyone for coming out and stuff. Um, I feel really honored to join the conversation. Um, this is also something I, I think about a lot, partially because I watch as old forms of organizing no longer work, or more importantly, I guess I should say, they don't necessarily connect with people or people see them as disingenuous or they see them as having kind of failed them in the past. And so people are looking for new ways that feel more intuitively authentic. And so I think people have a pretty good bullshit meter when they get into something that feels like an organizing space and that it feels like something of the past. But then it works especially for the right. I think the way that the right organizes itself amongst its rank and file is by telling a story of liberation to them. That is fundamentally the story. We're talking a lot about uh, the Israeli far right and the assault on Gaza right now. So this is sort of in my mind. But Zionism is largely a story of liberation. It's uh, reframing the story of Jewish suffering and told that liberation happens <laughs> essentially by mimicking Gentile imperialism, right? By, by kind of um, taking that on as their own or taking that on particularly right now. And that happens all across the far right it is this, this way of mobilizing very serious experienced angst in a lot of communities, dislocation, alienation, disindustrialization, um, attacks on unions, widening wage gap. There are real things that people are experiencing and they look for really clear stories about them. And that is what the right mobilizes. The more it mobilizes that, the less institutional it becomes. Because the GOP is very visibly a vehicle for capital, um, even most of the rank and file right can see that, that they basically push tax cuts for billionaires, that they attack trade unions, that they do basic things that actually affect working people's lives, including their constituency. So what happens as they move forward is more and more an insurgent message is what connects with them. 
So essentially what we see on the far right is a version of class struggle. They're telling a class story. They're just using different language for it. And they're directing you away from the ruling class uh, to marginalized folks. And so this is as we get to a place where the status quo works for less and less people, this revolutionary rhetoric has to come in some direction. So they're essentially hijacking those conditions and telling a different story. And so when we're talking about the structures that they had in the past, those no longer speak to anyone. The Republican Party is not a vessel for right-wing politics anymore. People might use it. Donald Trump might use it, but he's not a Republican in the classical sense. Even as we see the Republican primary starting, the two key, key figures are both dissident figures, so and so forth. One of them actually does have right-wing money behind them and stuff, but they, they frame themselves as dissident figures. They try and speak at stuff that makes them portray as working class, even though they're, they're both clearly not. Um, and they want to be able to, that's where they're going to build their energy because they know that the, their constituency has energy because of strife and they want to be able to channel that strife somewhere. That's the way they get the energy. And so what's ended up happening is that they have to recreate these forms of organization. It used to be formal organizations, a big party status. That's what helped happen. But that no longer really speaks to people. And in a lot of ways, stuff like social media actually has done the work that formal organizations used to. It links people up. It gives them a common language, uh, gives them targets um, to channel anger towards, things like that. And so they're able to autonomously organize much, much more quickly. So like when I used to go to cover like a far right rally, maybe 2013, 2014, it would be a formal organization, maybe a neo-Nazi organization. And they'd call people, they'd have a phone tree, they'd get people out and stuff. So you'd sort of you know, infiltrate best you can, get their information, figure out who's there. And that's how you do it. If I go to something in 2021, usually those rallies come together within a matter of days on places like Facebook groups or maybe Telegram channels. The people don't really know each other, but somehow they're able to speak the talking points immediately walking into the space because they've had this common language from kind of a common social media culture. It just moves much more fluidly and quickly. There's no one to take down. You can't take down their leadership because their leadership doesn't exist any longer. It's why, for example, something like, you know, uh, heavy charging of the Oath Keepers of the Proud Boys does little to take on the far right because they don't need them anymore, right? They don't need those figures very much. They're able to organize without them. And the scale they're able to organize is just huge and profound. We're not talking about dozens of neo-Nazis like you would be at that rally 10 years ago. We're talking about thousands of people flooding a metro area and maybe flooding a school board meeting or maybe flooding like a, a youth gender facility, raise like a really overwhelming into a really threatening way. So they've discovered how to coordinate each other. And in a lot of ways, because their analysis is not the most sophisticated in the world, they're actually able to reproduce themselves really quickly. It's a really easy to explain analysis. They're really able to mobilize the anger and it's become almost like a machine is their entire language is able to reproduce themselves. Us on the other hand, not as doing it as quite as well, right? We obviously have more people in our constituency, right? Like we have always had more people affected because we have a narrative about what works, right? We actually are trying to challenge conditions and give people real tools and that's meaningful to people. Um, but our ability of bringing folks into a kind of a large mass that's able to be fluid, to adapt, that's something that challenges us a lot. And I think it's something that we see growing pains on, you know? When I'm at mass demonstrations in 2020, I saw huge numbers of people come out I also saw huge numbers of people get in arguments uh, midway through, have, not for sure how to organize themselves, not sure how to build new organizations and working that stuff out in real time. Now I have a real faith in people's ability to work that stuff out. You know, I've seen it, I've been a part of it being worked out and stuff. Um, but those are challenges and hurdles that we have to overcome. And I think building up the kind of relationships that are able to change where organization, just a particular organization, isn't what limits us, but our ability to kind of move autonomously and rebuild structures as necessary, I think that's what's going to give us the keys here. I mean, the things that you're describing are very much, you know, what complexity science teaches us about how change happens in the natural world and how ecosystems operate in the natural world by being fluid, adaptive, decentralized, um, and, and iterative and responsive to conditions and changing accordingly. And, you know, part of what emergent strategies tell us is that we're like, we're not, uh, not of the natural world. We are too, in the way that you know, ant societies function and the way that human societies functions are not all that different. And that those function most effectively when there isn't a single top-down, there isn't in an ant society, a single top-down messenger and director, even though um, sometimes it's framed that way, it's actually just people communicating, as you said, simple messages. 
right? Mm -hmm. That that um, they communicate amongst each other and are able to move literally, um, some scientists would say ants are the most influential um, species on the planet. And they're able to do that through coordinated action, basically that's decentralized and that's moving based on simple messages. I think the stories that, um, and and simple messages that you're describing that, that I think another reason that they're they're so successful is because they are the stories that this nation was built on right they're the stories of white supremacy they're the stories of settler colonialism they're the stories of manifest destiny they're the story of um, patriarchal and homophobic transphobic um, uh, racial capitalist society and so they align with that and therefore um, have kind of wind at their back and I think what what gets chronicled really well in No Pasaran and other things that you and others have written is this very intentional shift to that the strategies that you're describing. And I think all of us are seeing the stuff that's happening at the judicial legislative policy level. And we think that's where the action is. We think ALEC is where the action is for the right and, and all the other institutions, Heritage Foundation, et cetera, you know, Tea Party, whatever it is. And that is where the action is, but it's the tip of the iceberg, right? And that we are kind of hitting up here and we're not necessarily paying as much attention to what's happening down here. And that, um, you know, whether you're looking at dominionism, where the strategy is go and make disciples, go everywhere you are and tell these stories and get in relationship with people, um, whether it's just, you know, plain old, you know, Christian evangelism, where, you know, when you lose someone, when you lose your farm, when you lose your job, someone is there to pray with you, sit with you, have coffee with you, bring food for you, take care of your kids, be there with you, and then bring you a message as part of that and tell these stories as part of that and build these really solid relationships that then make it such that, you know, you'll believe pretty much anything this person tells you because now you've built a solid relationship of trust with them. Um, and I think that piece is, is it's organizing, right? It's what it's what Ruth Wilson Gilbor says, we should be knocking on everyone's door and saying, hi, I'm Andrea and I'm an abolitionist. I'm here to solve your problems. We're not necessarily doing that as effectively, whereas the right is going to people's houses and saying, hi, I have an answer to your problems. And it means you need you know, to focus on those people over there as the problem. Um, so I think I knew that part. I don't think I knew as much about what you're saying about the deinstitutionalization and and horizontalization and decentralization that was happening and, and how folks are really focused on building webs instead of chains of commands. And even, and this really kind of broke my heart, although it, it makes sense because it's a strategy that works, that people on the right were looking to the work of Zapatistas, organizing of Zapatistas and other people in the global South and adopting this, uh, this dual power strategy of, you know, yes, we will fight the state, but we're also gonna build the world that we want that aligns with our story outside of it and practices outside of it. So can you say more about that? Because I, I really feel like, you know, the Patriot movement adopting dual power was maybe one of the more depressing things I read while I was reading you know, this book. One thing that's really interesting is the concept of a right-wing Gromschkian became really popular in the last year. Oh, I right? can't. So like for folks who don't kind of understand the Gromsky analysis, part of it is about building revolutionary culture so that politics can happen downstream with the idea that culture actually does influence social organization. So you can come in with a political program, but if people aren't even on the same wavelength, then this might not take off. So you actually have to build those sorts of things. So what essentially white supremacists did was they tried to figure out what is it inside of a person that I need to build up so as to build an infrastructure down the road. And there was a group of these far right sort of philosopher people that from France that had been sort of radicalized in defending France against Algerian independence. Uh, and that was sort of like where they had cut their teeth. And at one point they kind of flipped. They said, no, I think I think this Algerian and the National Liberation Front folks have like a, a point. I think they're fighting for identity. We're fighting for identity, right? Like what if we took a piece of their playbook and instead we actually used the, the language of the new left and decolonization and actually fought for a certain kind of white autonomy. And instead of, you know, just fighting, you know, for example, to preserve these colonies, what if we fought to preserve French white identity? What if we said, no, this is about restoring who you are. Remember who you are. 
Um, this actually reminds me of a lot of kind of like early Zionist propaganda where you'd see these kind of posters and, you know, we would have, you know, the hills of Samaria with like the, the uh, you know, grapes, like um, uh, wine grapes and vineyards covering it and say something like, remember who you are, you know. So it's about telling, retelling the story. All people's angst and throws, the real problems they have from losing their jobs, from neoliberalism, basically shrinking economies and things. All of that is then recast in the story of a lost identity. And they were doing this for years and no one was talking about it. And then when social organization came into it later on, they were ready to go. It's why the alt-right, people had never heard of it until 2015, but by the end of 2015, we're talking about huge organizations and a pretty big movement, right? That totally changed the politics in the country, maybe the world. How would that happen? It's because groundwork was laid for so long. And so they were learning from these like long conversations. We have those conversations on the left, they have those conversations on the far right. Uh, and I think part of it is that we often do make a caricature of the far right, and therefore we don't understand how it operates. Um, I think we understand them to be so disingenuous that we don't listen to what they're saying as perhaps sincere and honest. Um, and we also, I think, underestimate their ability to pick up on our failures. You know, the reality is I live in Portland, Oregon, 10 minutes away from me. I don't know any of those people. I have no base in that community at all, you know, um, and this happens all around the country right now in places where like left organizing has abandoned folks. There's a story I tell all the time, but I, I tell it all the time because I think it's really good. There's an organization out here called the, um, Rural Organizing Project. It was part of the anti, it was a kind of emergence of the anti clan network of the 80s and 90s. And it was formed specifically to, to combat Measure 9, which was this really uh, homophobic about measure in the early 90s, I think 92. And so they go, they have like little affiliates and, and small towns and they help them build up little campaigns. And so there was uh, an area, um, Indian Creek, Oregon. There's no ambulance service there, right? There's no high speed internet. There's nothing like that. We're talking about a very, very rural space. And so some people had brought in the militia to do a number of things. One is like, there's no ambulance service. They'll volunteer to take you to the hospital, right? They'll come They'll come and help you uh, help uh, elderly folks get their medication. They'll help deliver groceries. They will do those things for you. Um, and so what the Rural Organizing Project came in and was came in and empowered them to get to know their neighbors. They created a newsletter, set up a little community center at the general store with some computers. So it was like the one place you get internet. And about a year into this, the person who invited the militia in wrote a big public letter saying they don't need the militia anymore because they've now achieved all the things that they wanted, right? So like they pick up on where we are not actually there, where we haven't actually sat down with someone who's lost their farm or lost their home and talked to them about what they're going to do. And so I think when they notice our failures, it creates this huge, big opportunity. So that's part of what the Patriot Movement was so successful because they operated in rural areas where we were aren't we weren't typically. And you can kind of see the different brands of the far right exist in gap points where the left isn't usually, where the organized left isn't. Um, and so I think right there gives us, in a way, the opportunity of where to go to cut them off, you know, because it's those critical issues. It's also at places where we used to have a presence that gave people political education. Now we don't. We don't have labor unions, for example, right? There's not really good public education institutions people don't have libraries in a lot of the communities there's just like a lot of places where people used to intervene and give people a channel even churches to a degree um like the more kind of like left-leaning churches that was a larger institution years ago and it's not quite the same and so there's a lot of places where people engage in kind of non-commercial social activity that don't exist anymore and the ones that do exist in those places are the ones that are building up their movement and they've been unified in a lot of that and that's i think why libraries and um, book bans and um, kind of control over those institutions has been a site of struggle, right? Like, we're like, why all of a sudden do they care about what's in the library? Well, they, it's not all of a sudden. They've been caring for a minute <laughs> um, and, and organizing around it. But I'm curious how you see those strategies then fueling some of what we're seeing around, you know, academic restrictions, book bans, um, attacks on trans people, attacks on migrants, like how are those gaps and the ways in which the right has filled them through, again, critical connections, relationships, small networks, um, and ultimately shaping a whole system where now we're like, oh, now there's 200 anti-trans bills passing across the country, you know, how did someone decide, you know, all of a sudden that, not all of a sudden again, but um, how did someone become so convinced that someone trans is is 
all of the things, the transphobic things that they accuse them of, or that having drag queen story hour is, you know, the end of the world, or et cetera, et cetera. And it's through organizing of these small of these spaces and these conversations. And so, how are you seeing that then shape the legislative landscape that we're in? I mean, I think part of it comes with what they have won. I mean, the main thing being to overturn Roe, right? This is a major victory because that was, at least for the institutional right, the primary way they fundraised, the primary way that they built up sort of like an angry energy, which feels so much of this. Like there's, they, they have to be able to kind of spark a sort of outrage cycle that keeps things turning and keeps like a certain kind of social reproduction happening. And so that's been redirected towards particularly attacking trans kids in a, like a really, really cruel way. Uh, the border, obviously, attacking migrants has been just something that has paid dividends for them since the early 90s, and it's continuing. Anything that they can frame in this really apocalyptic, kind of threatening way, because they have a fundamentally kind of conspiratorial worldview, they have to take people's kind of real insecurity and retell it with a target. So yeah, you're experiencing insecurity at your job and it just happens to be the immigrant that's doing it. Or you may feel turmoil at home. Maybe you don't connect with your kids. It's because of trans propaganda or those books in school. And so that gives people that, that channel. I mean, I think the irony of it is that it directs people's energy away from the actual people in power every single time, right? It redirects it from anything that could possibly be useful. And then it creates that cycle. But feeding outrage like that is something that, has funneled not just money coming in, but rank and file energy. It's why there's a kind of current of violence at the edges of these movements, even at their most contained, right? Because you're feeling this kind of desperate anxiety and desperate anxiety, particularly ones that actually can't change their own lives. Like, you know, that kind of anxiety isn't going to have any positive effect on their life. That tends to lead people to like these seemingly impulsive acts of violence. So it just, that is sort of implicit to it. And it's how it reproduces itself. There is no movement, I think, without it. Yeah, I I really um, particularly agree with the piece that you're saying about where the any anxiety, including internal anxieties within those formations, is so skillfully directed externally um, and and towards people within their reach uh, who are deemed other, right? And and how skillfully it's directed to the border, to wherever folks want. Um, to the abortion clinic, to the library, to the school, to the you know university, wherever um, folks point that target is just is very uh, skillfully done. I guess I want to. I think the transnational nature of this is not something that we talk much about. And I just you know you tweeted earlier today about, or maybe some one of these terrible days um, about how the right in the U.S. is fueling, supporting, and connecting with, and building. Kind of a system of influence with the Zionist right in Israel and you know the right around the world um, that are aligned, whether it's Modi's government or the far right in in various countries in Europe and beyond. Um, I just I, I wonder if you could flesh out for people what those critical connections and relationships and webs are, because if we are to you know really intervene in this moment around the genocide in Gaza beyond just insisting that, you know, elected uh, officials from the president and Congress take a side against genocide and, and continuing to be in the streets and intervening in other ways. Um, it also requires us to disrupt those networks. And so we have to understand what they are and how they're operating. Yeah, I think it's interesting because it really dispels the notion that Likud or the, the, the Israeli far right takes Jewish safety as their primary interest, right? So Netanyahu is building relationships with the Hungarian far right, which is almost explicitly anti-Semitic and makes, you know, George Soros conspiracy is a key piece of it. They're uh, partnering in the largest organizational form in the U.S. with Kufi Christians United for Israel, whose belief about Jews is that they must essentially be sacrificed at the end times to bring about Jesus. They're coordinating with other far-right parties all across Europe, the AFD, Alternative for Deutschland, which has you know former neo-Nazis in it. So why would they be partnering with a bunch of anti-Semites if their politics actually were something different? If it actually was about you know ethnic nationalism and power? Um, and trying to maintain that against the turning tides of you know humanitarianism or, or humanist politics, that kind of thing. They are creating an alternative 
model for the 21st century. If they see progress one place that would threaten their power, they're simply going to build up a different kind of politics. And so that kind of international coordination is absolutely essential to it. You know, we live in an international world, right? Everything, information, capital goes across borders. And so they are actually doing that with their political muscle. And they're really learning really smart lessons from each other. I mean, if you look at the way, that, for example, Hindu nationalism is now being sold internationally, it's learning incredibly well from the Israeli far right, right? The ways that they're building, framing it as a civil rights sort of movement, how they're connecting with diaspora communities. It's like a really well-coordinated kind of taught program. Um, and it does that so that it's able to repackage the same kind of far right politics that people have been a little bit immured to it and also speak the language of actual oppression. They're going to talk about, for example, actual anti-South Asian bigotry that people experience in the U.S. So they're going to talk about anti-Semitism. Anti they're going to make those the actual issues. And so that coordination is what's going to give them that power and actually the finances of it, too, because if we're talking about building a financial base for these, I think what's uncomfortable for folks is that it usually isn't just a top-down distribution of funds. It actually is small donations, people participating, you know, um, uh, it really is coming from both above and below. And I think that reality, they're able to channel that when we're talking about international collaboration, we're talking about more money and be able to shift resources where they're most vulnerable or where they're most necessary. Um, and it's something that I think people were sort of aghast about when seeing Israeli politicians meeting with these far right uh, parties. But when you're actually looking at the reality of the coalition government in Israel, the politics they're proposing, and of course, like their openly genocidal policies in Gaza, it makes total sense, right? It is about extending hegemony. It's about contain continuing Western imperialism. It's about maintaining these structures at all costs. I think the involvement of, of folks in, again, I think we focus are very much on governments and the imperial uh, imperatives that they are all advancing um, and and the, the ways in which they're colluding and collaborating in this genocide. And I think this piece about the grassroots um, support that is through these same right-wing networks that we were talking about in including evangelical Christians of all uh, kind of stripes. I think the question is, in addition to targeting governments and and um, corporations that are uh, that are creating the bombs and the the governments that are um, uh, fueling them and and paying for them, what are the points of intervention into that distributed network, whether it's in the U.S. or transnationally, of of I, I can't even say you know right wing Gramscious because that doesn't it's not you can't say it but um you know of right wing uh, distributed networks of folks who are who are telling stories shifting culture and building uh, through relationships connections these small donations and really shifting the whole world in in a direction that we're seeing in its most violent virulent toxic form in this moment um, in Israel and and the way that it's um, raining violence down on Gaza. I mean, I think I think one of the things that has to be looked at with the global far right is just the conditions in which it's created. You know, if you give communities actual powerful tools to take power for themselves, like ones that actually are viable, that actually show results, that is the biggest blow to the far right that's possible. A real community where they know each other, where they can count on each other, that's something that most people simply do not experience. I think if I was to go out and talk to my neighbors, how many of you feel like you really have a community? You have people you can depend on, people that will show up for you. If you lost your job, would you end up without a place to live? I don't think that most people in these spaces have the experiences, but if they did, we'd be talking about something different. I think building up those, building up mutual aid networks, building up the labor movement, things that give people kind of real tangible things are one of the most important ways to totally flip that on its head. Those are also spaces in which we struggle in, right? When you engage in a labor union, not everyone agrees on things, right? You're going in there and say, this is the space to start, you know? Same thing with the mutual aid network. I don't think there's any reason to expect that everyone comes in with some kind of radical left politics, right? Like it's a place to struggle, but it's a great starting point for it. I think if we're talking about the Gromskian question, there's lots of places that we exist in multiple communities. 
Now, I'm Jewish. I go to a regular synagogue. I don't go to like a, a overly political synagogue. You know, the synagogue I go to right after October 7th held a rally where they brought all the uh, the senators and Congress people in. Also, they would promise to increase Iron Dome funding, right? As everybody cheered, right? This is, this is a community I'm in. I take ownership over it, right? Like I actually am there. Um, and so I think offering people, building up community that connects with the people in that space, that offers them alternatives, that reframes that narrative is actually useful. So for example, I, do, I don't think that anyone can make the argument that aggressive Israeli nationalism keeps Jews safe. I don't think of that as a tremendously safe bunch of people, right? But I do value Jewish safety. And I think it only comes in solidarity with other people. That's the only way it has ever historically come. And I want to sell that to people. I want to offer that and give people viable channels for that. And I want to give them viable channels for building Jewish community and having spiritual connections. So having that space and to be able to struggle in that way, I think is useful. And in that space, I can do that in a way that someone who's not in the space just simply can't, right? So like acknowledging where you're at, and I think building that is really useful. And we're in multiple communities, right? Like there's multiple spaces that I feel like I'm I'm in, the spaces I feel like other somebody else might might their voice might be heard better in that space. So I think developing that is going to be really important. You know, I there's a lot of I think there's a lot of rhetoric that looks at the fact that particularly economic and social instability re leads to the far right. And they say, okay, let's address those conditions. I think we are past addressing those conditions. I think those conditions are implicit and instead only a revolutionary movement to change them fundamentally is what's really possible. So I think there's steps along the way that can make people's lives better and we should do that, but we should also leave them to real visioning. What comes after? Can we get to something after? And what can we do to get there? I think that is what we should start thinking about now. I think most people are really ready for that. I don't think that people have the level of complacency that often gets projected onto them. I think most people are pretty close to actually throwing in the towel on their day-to-day -day lives. You know, um, in my day life, I work uh, with a labor union. And if I ask workers, most of them, what would you be willing to strike tomorrow to change something? It's almost uniform. Right. They would walk off the job. It doesn't matter how long it takes. People are really committed to that. It doesn't mean that people don't have struggles and things holding them back. That happens all the time. But I think people know that this isn't working and they want to have the imagination for something different. So giving them the pathway there, not that I have the clear pathway there, but doing it with them, I can do it with them, you know, and hear from them as much as possible. I think having that be on the table is what's necessary. Uh Andrea, I think I lost you. Can you hear me, Andrea? Oh, here we are. I can I hear you. Back. I'm back now. Okay. I think you're back now. Thanks. Um, sometimes Disney streaming upstairs. Yeah, it. <laughs> um, but uh I I I think you're absolutely right in the and this is this is what emergent strategies kind of comes to. And so this is the, you know, cycling through the fight that's been going on in my head for as long as I've been thinking about um, these ideas is that actually emergent strategies are the only way that we can survive this moment and actually disrupt the networks that are making the world that we're in right now. And, you know, Mariam uh, Kaba says, you know, we make the world every day and we're in a world that other people made. We're in living in someone else's imagination, as Audre Lorde said. And so how do we make the world in the way that we want to? And it has to be through these um, practices and strategies. And so when I'm thinking, oh, how do these strategies hold up against uh, this massive state violence and and the the threats of white supremacist violence and and growing hegemony and it's it's exactly like on the one hand I'm I'm like oh my gosh they won't hold up and it's like actually these are the only strategies that do hold up in the sense that um, they are fundamentally just organizing and and organizing you know where we are and being in relationship where we are and and um, and then not just staying in our little, you know, emergent strategy commune, but actually reaching out to the places that are uncomfortable, that are, that we're connected to in some ways, but require us to do the work of um, 
imagining and practicing new worlds with people who have a different vision of um, the futures that we're building. Um, and I appreciate also you naming that mutual aid is essential to those futures and um, and other kinds of decentralized organizing. And I, I've been thinking a lot in these past uh, weeks and days about anti-apartheid organizing that I uh, was involved in in, in my um, late teens and 20s and how that was a way of coming at, you know, a massive system of violence in a very de decentralized and transnational way, right? Which is there was some very clear kind of um, directives that were sent out by the ANC and, and liberation uh, freedom fighters in South Africa who were like, you know, don't finance, support, or legitimize anything that finances, supports, or legitimizes the South African apartheid state. And that meant all of us had to look around where we are and say, what what's doing that? Let me target that. So for labor unions, it was, is my employer targeting that? Let me be in solidarity with South African trade unions. For students like me, it was like, does my institution I'm attending invest in South Africa, divest? You know, people who are shareholders, divest from there. People um, who are, you know, in cultural work, divest from there and, and hold people responsible who are not divesting. And I think, um, there's a, a similar way that decentralized organizing needs to happen, not just in the way of relationship and, and telling different stories and inviting people into other worlds that we're practicing, but really kind of looking around us and finding ways to um, to shift the, the power relations and culture in all the spaces that we're in. And so um, it just feels like when we're we're feeling overwhelmed by the task of taking on, you know, the global growing right or um, the vast systems of power that are um, facilitating and enabling and, and manufacturing so much violence right now, the looking around to where we are immediately around us and moving in a in a decentralized way, but focused on some simple principles and, and politics that I mean, not simple in the sense that they aren't about taking down complex systems like racial capitalism, but just, you know, some primary abolitionist principles, uh, principles that um, align with the a free Palestine, principles that align with um, solidarity economies, whatever the kind of um, frame that we wanna be and how we move in decentralized ways is, feels to me like the way that we disrupt what feels like an impenetrable and growing web of white supremacy but i'm curious if if that kind of strategy both relational in the way that you were describing but also um practicing taking on targets in at the community level um in coordination with each other and in a kind of decentralized movement that is pointed in a particular direction feels like something that's actually gonna shift the tides in this country right now and globally yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I think it's easier for organizing that has a local focus. It's easier to vision that than, for example, international solidarity work, which I think is more complicated. I think it's legitimately a, a more complicated question. You know, I spent most of my young years organizing and housing stuff, whether it was housing blockades, I was just with the Take Back the Land movement. So we would... Um, find houses that were empty from foreclosure and we just go open them up and support a houseless family into moving in and then we'd also blockade um uh, houses that were um facing foreclosure evictions or or tenant evictions right so that's very direct and you can win or you lose and you know may not win the majority of them may actually win quite a few and even just a few victories stacking up with other organizations when you coordinate with them when you figure out messaging and cross kind of national collaboration that actually has a huge impact right that can push really major changes it can have a steamrolling effect there's a lot that actually happens when you're organizing in your workplace or you're organizing in your apartment building and I think that's the most direct way to see it. And when people are feeling disempowered, I think that doing those sorts of things where direct action is immediately visible is perhaps the most empowering way to like kind of walk into it. Mutual aid networks is another example, right? Um, people felt, I think it, it had, it paid dividends in 2020. So people had the immediate need, right? The state's failure was so profound around COVID right away. And there was really nothing on offer. So mutual aid was the only thing that made sense. And that kind of helped it to spread really fast. That also, like we have things like 
signal chats. We just didn't have that when I was young, you know, like we didn't have those sorts of tools that made stuff reproduce faster. Um, but then it was also the only thing on offer. And so that built that. But then that got a lot of people involved in organizing that shifted directly to support the protests just a few months later. And those were that was an infrastructure that was now there. And they were doing things like coordinating ride shares and bail and bringing food and helping people have masks and to use hand sanitizer. So it was right there. And then out here, there was, uh, you know, climate related forest fires. Right. So like that happened directly afterwards. And all of a sudden, all those people who are now both in the protest movement and the mutual aid networks, they were out supporting people, at the forest fires. So these things have the ability to move together. Together. When you are able to see something kind of work, when you're able to kind of pliably build a project and watch it work, I think that has the, the transformation. It is different when we're talking about Gaza because you have to work with systems that are by their definition alienating. You know, I don't think that appealing to Congress is an empowering act necessarily, nor do I think that having Congress is a great manifestation of the people's will. You know, but I know that right now intervening and cause start uh, pushing for a ceasefire is the most important next step. It is not the last step It is not what I think will ultimately bring liberation for Palestine. Right. But I do think that we have to stop the the um, the assault. So I think having some sort of tangible stepping stones in that work is also really, really important. Finding a way to bring it back home, though, you know, so like, for example, you know, I'm on the board for uh, Portland Jobs of Justice. We put out a statement basically in solidarity with the Palestinian labor movement. It's a bunch of labor unions. So we connect with the Palestinian labor movement and see what are they actually asking for here? You know, what kind of measures do they think is supportive? I think doing that where you're at isn't particularly useful. That's a good way of doing international solidarity. It's not the final way, right? Like there's a lot of steps along the way. But I think, I, I think people get, particularly if you haven't been involved in organizing, it seems new. This idea that there's huge problems that you have to somehow you yourself bring to scale, I think is is something that keeps a lot of people out of doing useful work or empowering work. I think finding something that feels really personally meaningful that you can actually see change affected in, that's the best and most important next step. And the other thing is that I want people, I want this to be their lives. I want them to feel like they're stepping into their lives when they do these sorts of things. So fine. I think if it doesn't feel that way, it's not sustainable. It's not going to work. It's not going to have the effect you want. So finding the space where you feel really seen and that you're able to really make a difference on the micro scale, it will stack up to being something big. Yeah. I think that the, the one thing I um, talk about in the book is that you know, understanding abolition, and of course, abolition involves abolition of imperialism, and clearly, and genocidal violence, um, uh, brings sort of these very overwhelming uh, charges, like Ruth Wilson Gilmore charges us to change one thing, everything, you know, that's, that's an overwhelming charge. This is an overwhelming moment. And it brings, um, understanding abolition is fractal kind of brings it into the realm of the actionable, right? It brings it down to the human scale. It brings it down to like, I can practice a free, pa a world in which Palestine is free in every moment of every day, in every conversation I have, I'm in an Uber, well, you know, you can, you can assess your safety and, you know, um, privilege and et cetera in, in situations, but I can be in a place having a conversation and trying to shift in the ways that you're saying the story, the, the understanding that it can be part of a march that is shifting kind of a national uh, messaging. We've seen the US government's messaging shift, and then we've seen it shift in another direction in response to the power of our movements, right? And so it's watching, you know, how we um, are having an impact and then continuing to iterate and adapt as we, as we can. So I do think, um, seeing the every action we take, every relationship we're in, every community we're part of and building as an opportunity to create the world that we want does help us see ways of um, of tackling large systems, particularly in moments like this, where like you say, I mean, Congress, the presidency, the courts, the UN, like everything is, is powerless or in collusion with what's happening. And so, you know, what are we doing as a people to try and shift the systems of, uh, to shift those conditions as a system um, through individual actions, collective actions, communal actions, 
uh, transnationally coordinated actions, trans uh, locally coordinated actions is is where we can have an impact. I think the other thing that you say that I wanted to kind of close on because of this, well, sorry, the other thing I wanted to say about um, even in, in Gaza in this moment, I think to the extent that people are surviving, they are surviving through relationship and through communities and solidarity networks that they have created within Palestinian communities in Gaza, beyond Gaza, transnationally, and the ways in which people have built networks and relationships and allyships and uh, through conversation, through public education, through political education, through solidarity work. And, and so I think it is important to understand these principles as important to our resistance and survival, which brings me to the last thing, which is I, I think that, and I wanna ask you this particularly in the context of Portland, because a lot of us saw in 2020, y'all doing a fierce occupation, y'all creating fierce autonomous zones, y'all really pushing that city council and the mayor in all of their problematicness to particular places, right? That that was purely through building power and organizing. And we saw white supremacists coming every night to fight you. Um, and and sometimes in deadly ways um, and certainly in physically harmful and, and spiritually and emotionally harmful ways. How do you see, um, uh, you know, moving in ways that are decentralized and adaptive and rooted in communities of practice like affinity groups and um, kind of iterative and, and nimble um, as a way of defending against that kind of violence and against the kind of violence that we're seeing when state repression rains down on our movements, whether it's a, a military or a police or a private corporation uh, raining down on us? How do you see these principles helping us more effectively resist and collectively survive? I think it's an it's an unfinished, there's an unfinished answer to this question because on the one hand, I think it's absolutely true that adaptive forms of organizing are less able to be infiltrated. It's less able to, to be attacked. It's more able to respond. That's 100% true. We also are in a situation in which I think we operate under like the thin veneer that security culture keeps us safe from something. And I, I am not convinced that it does. And so I've seen a lot of those things, those kind of this infrastructure of safety collapse on itself and people get charged and you know have their signal chats read back to them or have affinity groups be treated as incorporated organizations and trials or you know there's been various things they they when we sort of decentralize they will centralize for us in a way sometimes so i i think it's something that you constantly have to be able to adapt to but i think what it does actually allow people to do is to do the evolution you were talking about and respond to new conditions and i think a lot as things change as conditions change i think people are more and less comfortable with those things i mean like what one thing that really happened in 2020 was um because the police were so violent and because they were so unwilling to intervene when the far right folks attacked up to shooting and killing people um what people created was decentralized community defense networks that up up to and including armed community defense right and that's actually if i go to you know someone uh, defending drag queen story hour or something here you can expect that half of the left that comes out is going to be armed um it's a different situation now and they've been responding to those different situations and in a lot of ways what that requires is people having closer human relationships, not just organizational relationships, but people kind of connecting with each other in really profound ways. That is part of the shift. The other shift also is just that situation is more dire in most people's lives. You know, works, workplaces have become more difficult. We're dealing with global pandemics, we're dealing with climate collapse. And so those in a weird way actually do force us to be real with each other um, and to see sort of in, uh, invested. Um, and it happens kind of more and less. It, comes, it happens in fits and starts. But I think that having that where you're valuing that kind of human community as the, the fundamental sort of organizing nucleus, I think that is what has really changed here. And when you have that, I think the calculations are different. I think the strategy becomes different. I think the sense of wholeness and the investment becomes profoundly different. And so I've seen that happen here. I've also seen those things collapse on each other. And I've seen there be generational disputes or uh, um, 
sort of like ideological uh, kind of clashes and things that created a lot of boundaries between people that weren't helpful. But those are things are thing, things I think people are working through, you know, that in one year, I think people aged quite a bit and lots of new organizations and movements were birthed out of that. The entire framework changed um, of, of organizing here in the entire area, probably the Pacific Northwest and probably the country if we're looking at it in a different frame. And so that kind of big step forward, I think, allowed us to actually adapt to what is a profoundly different world just a few years later. Like the threats we're talking about are just so different now. And so I think those steps were what kind of happened during that. I think you might have lost Andrea again. Oh, I got you back. Here I am. Great. Um, yeah, I think that yeah, we need to continue to adapt to conditions, you know, as they're changing, not to become more numb to them, not to become more inured to them, not to become more accustomed to them, but to become more nimble and adaptive and effective in responding to them, interrupting them and shifting systems in the direction of the future that we want. So I'm so deeply grateful to you for the work that you do to study the things that were and people and structures and communities that we are in a competing vision of the world uh, with, because I think that uh, it's only through understanding them better and the strategies that they're deploying and stealing from us um, and the places where they are stepping in because we are not there um, that we can shift the systems that are creating the violence that we're fighting and experiencing in the world. So I just want to encourage everyone to read everything Shane has written. Also, there's some great um, movement memos podcasts uh, with Kelly Hayes and Shane uh, speaking. Grab um, No Pasaran for sure to hear um, the incredible collection of voices he put together. And um, before you go to on to your next thing or the end of your day, I hope that you will find a protest. You will send yet another email that you will Think of someone that you can be in conversation with to shift um, their understanding and perspective of this moment and then invite them to action and bring them into whatever uh, community of, of um, practice or organizing that you're part of. Um, and with that, I think we'll close out for the night. Thank you so much, Liberty, for having us and Firestorm Books for always being a space and a place where we can have these kinds of conversations and conversations that bring us closer to liberation. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for your presence and existence and for having us here tonight. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. And I really do encourage people to pick uh, Practicing New Worlds. I, the ability to sort of imagine kind of new forms of resistance is actually what makes me excited about that kind of work. Um, and I think so often end up feeling rear focused when uh, looking forward is what's, what's so empowering. Thank you both. Yes, just to reiterate, Everybody, please read both of these folks um, and the work that they're doing. It's fantastic. It's inspiring and it's useful. I think reading Practicing New Worlds, I was just really struck by what a valuable resource it is to those of us who are doing organizing or who want to start doing organizing. Um, so yeah, great appreciation and thank you for your time tonight. Thanks to everybody who joined us. We're going to go ahead and sign off. Um, hopefully we'll do this someday in person. Uh, and in the meanwhile, good luck out there, everybody. Uh, keep up the hard work. Thanks, Liberty. Thanks, Firestorm.